Hey guys, welcome back to Axangel RC. On the heels of my rather lengthy live stream on setting up RG Pilot at the field prior to flying, I thought it would be very useful if I made a condensed version of the setup process for this flight controller so you wouldn't have to sit through two hours of choppy video to see how this is done. Unlike the previous videos that I've done of this sort where the FC has received an analog video system, this time I am updating the setup with a proper HD video and control system and in particular the CMK15 radio paired to a CHN30 Air module. So no more messing about with enabling and arranging OSD items in the flight controller configuration software or having to set up and use a number of different systems. But this also comes with a few drawbacks, so we will cover all as the video progresses. So, the SpeedyB F405 Wing Mini. The smaller brother to the regular SpeedyB F405 Wing, but as it turns out, equally as capable, despite the smaller size. One big difference, which I found only after the live stream, was that rather than two Bluetooth and one Wi-Fi modes, like the big one has, this one has one Bluetooth and two Wi-Fi modes, one of which I was able to connect to with my laptop, which makes setting up the flight controller a lot easier and we will get to that very soon. Overall, this board looks pretty good and for the time being has not given me any hardware issues. Initially I assembled it so I can flash iNav8 on it for its Mavlink capability so I can test whether its Mavlink output is compatible with the UniRC7's expectation of a Mavlink implementation for its OSD overlay. And if you've seen this video, you know the results. If you haven't, it did not work. As of the making of this video, iNav is still incompatible with the CE system. However, I was not planning on keeping this flight controller on iNav. It soon found its way into the Reptile Dragon V2 and made the whole installation and wiring very easy and simple, but I feel like nowadays that goes for almost every flight controller of this type anyway. I would have killed for such a thing 10 years ago. So small, with all this connectivity and capability, it just didn't exist back then. But anyway. Initially, in order to get ArduPilot on it, we need to use the iNav configurator. I would assume Betaflight works too, but I have this one installed anyway, so might as well use it for something. While connecting the cable to the computer's USB port, make sure you press and hold the button on the expansion board. As the board powers up, this will put it in DFU mode, which you need in order to flash the ArduPilot firmware file. Once the configurator has confirmed that the board is in DFU mode, you can go to the ArduPilot firmware download website to get the version of firmware that you need. Personally, I always go for the stable releases. Scroll down to find the model of controller you have. In this case, the Wing and the Wing Mini use the same firmware file and once in that folder, make sure you download the file that has with BL in the name as that will also update the bootloader of the board to the ArduPilot one and that is what we need. Once the file is downloaded, go back to the configurator, go to the firmware flasher tab, then in the bottom right corner click load firmware local and navigate to the folder where you just saved the firmware file, select it and open it. This would enable the flash firmware button, hit that and wait for the process to finish, hopefully successfully. Once this is done, you can exit the iNav configurator, unplug the USB cable from the computer and open up Mission Planner. Once it loads, go to the port drop down in the top right corner and take a quick mental note of what ports are listed there. Close it and plug in the USB cable back into the computer, wait for the initialization beeps from Windows and open the drop down menu again. Note which is the new port in the list and select that one. Then select 115,000 from the Baudrey drop down next to it and hit connect. If all is good, the user interface should come to life and the parameters should load very quickly. But here is the convenient part. Since we now know Arduplane has installed OK and is working, we can go ahead and try the wireless connectivity option for the SpeedyB F405 Wing Mini which will make calibrating the accelerometers a lot easier when there is no cable tying it to the computer. If, 
One would use a compass. Using the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connection options makes calibrating that also a breeze. But in this case, we will skip it since we don't really need the compass on a regular FPV plane, which is not a veto or for more serious industry work. So you are going to need to get the LED on the expansion board to go whitish or very light bluish. I can't tell which one it is, but you need that one. Then open the available Wi-Fi networks list on your computer and connect to the speedy B1. There should be no password required. Now when you start Mission Planner, it should automatically detect the network and switch into the UDP mode and start the connection and parameter loading automatically as well. That is how you know all is good. Parameters will load, UI will liven up and we are ready to do some setting up. Now the first thing I like to do is to calibrate the accelerometer. Go to the Setup tab on top and then expand the mandatory hardware subtap if it is not already expanded and go to Accelerometer Calibration. Click on the topmost button and follow the instructions. It will tell you to position the plane in each orientation and press a button at every step. I usually go for the space bar. Once done, the accelerometer will be calibrated and for the most part, the autopilot should have a fairly good idea where level is. Next step would be to go to the Compass subtap and remove the ticks for all three compass options. This will disable the use of a compass, so you will not get that pre-arm check error about the compass not being calibrated when trying to arm the plane. Here though, you will have to use the reboot option to get the changes to actually register. Next down the list is the radio calibration subtap. Here you will tell the autopilot what the endpoints are of all the channels you've assigned to this model, which are being sent from the radio to the autopilot. In the case of the CMK15 radio that I'm using here, there are 14 channels, so when you start the calibration process, just move all the sticks to their extreme positions, click every button, slide every slider, and flick every switch through every position, then hit the click when done button, wait for the confirmation, click OK, and this step is also done. In Arduplane, channel 8 is your flight modes channel, Keep that in mind, it can be reassigned, but this is the default one, and in all the years that I've used the Pilot platform, I've never once had to reassign it. Next sub-tab down the line is the Servo Output tab. This is an important one. Here you tell the Autopilot what each output should do, and that would be based on how you've connected stuff to the Autopilot in the plane. In my case, I have the two motors in the first two ports, so positions 1 and 2 would be throttle. Or if you want to mix that in with the rudder for some more pronounced turning action, you can select throttle left and throttle right. This will give you differential thrust when using the rudder. Just make sure you are assigning the correct value to the correct motor. I have motor left paired to throttle left and the right motor paired to throttle right. In the full parameter list, there is a parameter which allows you to select how much throttle would be given to each motor as you move the rudder. It can go from 0 to 100%. So at 100%, when you move the rudder fully to either end, one motor is going to get 100% of the throttle, the other one will stop spinning, and you will very easily be able to get into a flat spin. I would imagine. I haven't tested it, and I'm not planning to. Following after the motors are the ailerons connected to two separate ports, but both get the same aileron selection. Having them on separate ports means we can control them from the same stick, but we can make trim and endpoint changes to each individually, which is very convenient when trimming is needed. And last, as per general rule, are the elevator and rudder in that specific order. Now, just like the compass, for changes to really take effect here, the flight controller needs to be rebooted. And the easiest way to do that is to go back to the compass sub-tap and use the button. Once it reboots, we need to get to the next sub-tap, which is the serial ports. In there, we need to set up the port, which will provide the Mavlink telemetry data to the CHM30 air unit, which in turn would facilitate it getting to the ground and from the ground back up to the plane. I have some cables soldered to the pads for UART4, which on this flight controller apparently corresponds to serial port 4. So we go to that, select 56k as the speed since that is what the C system is set up for. 
and from the protocol menu select Mavlink 2. Now, however, in order for this to take effect, we will have to again reboot the FC, so go to the compass menu and hit the button and check this out. As soon as the autopilot reboots, the parameters start loading in the Uni GCS app on the MK15 radio immediately, showing all of this has worked correctly. It is so awesome when things work out so well. This is literally the only thing that needs doing to get the OSD working in the C system, be it the new Uni RC7 or this older MK15. I do admit it is a lot more convenient compared to wiring in an analog one, the drawback though is that the OSD is arranged by C, and at least at this time there is no way for the user to rearrange the information or add or remove stuff from it. Following this, we can go to the flight modes sub tab and configure the flight modes based on what we need. Personally, I usually have manual on top, fly by wire in the middle, and auto tune for start, after which I change it over to something else depending on the particular model's use case. And here is the best bit. When we get to the failsafe sub tab, we don't in fact have to do anything. Return to land works out of the box on RG Pilot without the need for any setting up of that specifically. Check this out. I unplug the USB cable from the flight controller, which would be the equivalent of turning off the radio or losing the RC link in flight. And as you can see, the plane goes into circle mode for a few seconds to give some time for the link to be re-established. But if it isn't, it goes to return to land and shockingly enough return to land works well and returns the plane to its home point. Now this sort of exhausts what needs doing in the mandatory hardware section but there is one more thing that needs to be checked in the optional hardware and that is the battery monitor. By default since we flash the file for this board it should be enabled with the correct settings already there. I have no idea if these are correct for this flight controller but I'm not going to be changing anything right now. Flying it and keeping an eye on the current and the spent milliamp hours meters and consequently charging the battery will show how accurate it is. So now if we go to the main data tab since I am recording this indoors, you can see that the not ready to arm warning is up and if you click on it, it will tell you why. In this case, it is because there is no GPS lock, but once I go outside and there is a GPS lock, this warning should go away and the EKF filter will also become active with the GPS lock. So at this point, the plane is ready to fly. Before that, however, since the MK15 radio has a self-centering throttle, this might cause issues when trying to handle the plane and the radio at the same time, so we need to enable stick disarming as well. In the config tab, at the top, go to the full parameter list, then in the tree on the left, select arming. And then we need to change the arming rudder parameter. When you click with the mouse in the first box, a drop down menu will show up on the right, which makes it easy to select an option and it will automatically change the value in the first box. Then click right parameters and write the changes to the autopilot. This will now allow me to arm and then disarm the plane post flight via the rudder stick. For arming, it is throttle zero and rudder to full right for four seconds, and disarming is throttle to zero and rudder to full left for four seconds. This should make the system a lot safer with this radio on it. Now, I usually do prefer for the autopilot to take care of the takeoff, even on a maiden flight. Yeah, as shocking as that might sound to some people, that is how reliable RG Pilot has been for me over the years so I've learned to trust it with this in most cases. To that end, there are two options, either to set the takeoff mode to a switch or to program an auto mission and include a waypoint that will handle the takeoff, which is what I prefer to do. First, we need to go to the user parameters sub tab and assign the auto mode to a switch. In my case, I will assign it to channel 6, but you can use any available channel you want. Then we go to the plan tab at the top. You literally just start clicking away, put as many waypoints as you need, or if you don't need any, put just one. Then at the bottom, from the drop down menu next to the waypoint, select take off as the action for this one and in the first cell to the right you should enter the pitch angle the autopilot should aim for when gaining the required altitude during takeoff. 
I prefer to use 15 degrees here to make sure it doesn't overdo it and stall the plane. After you are done, hit the right button and this will upload the waypoints to the autopilot. Going back to the data tab, we can verify in the head up display that all modes changes are working properly and we have auto mode engaging as it should. Flipping back the switch returns the autopilot to the mode you were in before switching to auto, so keep that in mind. One of the last things that I like to do is to set a larger radius for the loiter slash return to land mode. The default distance is very small and results in a very tight circle, so depending on where you fly, make it bigger. This is a small plane so 200 meters should be good, but on my larger birds I have set it to around 300. Makes for a nice gentle turn. And now, really, the last thing to do is to make sure the radio controls move the plane's control surfaces in the correct directions for proper control, and then Put the plane in a stabilized mode and check if it stabilizes correctly to bring the plane back to level. Usually the elevator needs reversing for most radio systems either from the radius options or by going to the radio calibration sub tap and then reversing the required channel. But other than that, if all is set up properly, you should not need to change anything in the radio. If it is stabilizing in a wrong direction, go to the servo output sub tab of the setup tab and select the tick box for the reverse option for the channel which is working in the wrong way. Test again and if all is good, the plane is finally ready. And now on the live stream, this was the part where I was ready for takeoff and not just any takeoff, auto takeoff. Sadly, all I have from that flight is the laggy livestream video, but you get the idea. Flip the auto mode switch, after arming of course, the plane will throttle up and just throw it with the nose up and away it goes. During the livestream I also tested the auto mode with a few waypoints, I demonstrated the working out of the box return to land mode, which returned the plane and made it circle above, and I have to say, Setting this up at the field, apart from wrestling with the wireless connection so I can remove the cable, was an absolute breeze. And there were no issues at any stage. I know people have complained a lot about SpeedyB's current sensors always being out of whack, and to be honest, out of the box I do feel like they are under-reporting a little bit, but since I have always judged my packs based on voltage, I can't say that it bothers me much. The important thing is that the core functionality works, and it works very well, with no random failures and mass. This has been a very pleasant experience and I would like to thank SpeedyB for sending me this unit for review and testing. I have flown the plane three more times since the live stream, did some more fine tuning to the parameters and adjusted a few more things, but for the most part this video will get you flying quickly and reliably with this flight controller and to be completely honest you can use it for pretty much any controller of this type out there. The flashing process and setup of Arduopilot is pretty much identical for all wing and I would presume non-wing controllers. Now then, if you have enjoyed this video and found it useful, do consider supporting the channel by becoming a member here or on Patreon or by using any of the affiliate links in the video description below. Also, if you haven't already, do subscribe and hit the bell so you will be notified whenever a new video is released. A huge Thank you to all of my YouTube members, my Patreon supporters and anyone else who is supporting this channel in any way. Fly safe and I will see you in the next one.